Neuromuscular junction, as its name indicates, is a junction between a neuron terminal and the muscle membrane. So, it's a junction not on the full muscle membrane. Membrane has a lot of muscle fibers. So, on those muscle fibers, this neuron makes contact forming neuromuscular junction. Each neuromuscular junction has three parts. That is a presynaptic membrane. So, this is a presynaptic membrane. Okay. Presynaptic because it is before the synapse and this presynaptic membrane is formed by neuron terminal. Then we have the synapse, okay, synaptic cleft rather, synaptic cleft. That is the space between the presynaptic membrane and the postsynaptic membrane. This is the postsynaptic membrane which is formed by the muscle membrane. And this thickened area of the muscle fiber where the neuron is making contact, it has a name and that name is motor end plate, motor end plate, right. It is important to remember this name because the potential change which will occur on this uh, motor end plate that is known as end plate potential. Now, what are the characteristic features of these various membranes? First of all, the presynaptic membrane. Presynaptic membrane, as I told you, it is formed by the neuron terminal. So, on the presynaptic membrane, we have certain channels. First of all, there is voltage-gated sodium channels. Then we have voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, voltage-gated calcium channels. And inside the nerve terminal, we have synaptic vesicles. So, there are synaptic vesicles here and within the synaptic vesicles, we have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter which is involved for transmission of nerve impulse or the message from the neuron terminal to the muscle, right? So, that is acetylcholine and each vesicle consists of 10,000. 10,000 acetylcholine molecules and this is known as one quanta because whenever the signal comes at least one vesicle is going to fuse with the membrane right actually many fuse but uh, you see that even when one vesicle fuse at least 10,000 uh, molecules of acetylcholine will release and if two vesicles fuse then at least 20,000 will release so this acetylcholine release is known as quantal release somewhere number in between will not come depending on the number of uh, the vesicles which are fusing with the membrane you just have to multiply it with this uh, number of acetylcholine molecules which are present in the vesicles and we get a quantal release of acetylcholine so this is about the presynaptic membrane then coming to postsynaptic membrane postsynaptic membrane is basically thrown into folds and uh, these folds they are known as synaptic troughs or we can say synaptic gutters okay so this there is some space forming in between no so that is why it is gutter invagination of the muscle membrane is known as synaptic trough or gutters and on this we have other channels or we can say receptors and these are n acetylcholine receptors or nicotinic acetylcholine receptors nicotinic acetylcholine receptors these are basically channels on which this acetylcholine can bind right and when this uh, acetylcholine binds with them then they open and allow the sodium entry so these nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are basically ligand gated ligand gated sodium channels okay ligand what is the ligand acetylcholine is a ligand so ligand gated sodium channels gated because when acetylcholine binds to these receptors then only these channels open then apart from this n acetylcholine receptors we have here voltage gated sodium channels okay voltage gated sodium channels so that is the basic uh, anatomy of the neuromuscular junction just one thing that here in the synaptic space, we have one enzyme as well and that is acetylcholinesterase, acetylcholinesterase, okay, important to know because this is the enzyme which is going to break down acetylcholine. So, that was about the neuromuscular junction. Coming to the steps of neuromuscular transmission. Here in this schematic diagram, we have shown the neuromuscular junction, the presynaptic membrane which has the voltage-gated uh, sodium channels and the voltage-gated calcium channels, right. Then we have, uh, uh, these are the vesicles 
on the postsynaptic membrane there is an acetylcholine receptor and there are voltage gated sodium channels so what are the steps of neuromuscular transmission steps are divided into two broad events that is the presynaptic events that is what is happening before the synapse that is in the presynaptic membrane and then there is postsynaptic events so in the presynaptic event first one is arrival of the action potential okay arrival of the action potential is the first one see in the neuron action potential is generated at the axon hillock and from there it is traveling to the neuron terminal so here when it reaches obviously everywhere throughout the node of ranvier there will be lot of voltage gated sodium channels that will cause the action potential to travel along the membrane and here also voltage gated sodium channels will open sodium entry so basically action potential is what it is depolarization right and this depolarization of action potential what it does is it opens the voltage gated calcium channels very important so depolarization caused by the action potential causes opening of voltage gated calcium channels present at the nerve terminal so second event is opening of voltage gated calcium channels then when these calcium channels open calcium enters from the extracellular fluid inside the nerve terminal because inside the concentration of calcium is very less always the concentration of calcium is more extracellularly so it enters from outside to inside thus increasing the calcium entry in the nerve terminal so third event is entry of calcium into the nerve terminal then this calcium causes the movement of vesicles onto the membrane the presynaptic membrane and here there are certain sites known as active sites where these vesicles can fuse actually these active sites have proteins known as t snare proteins t snare okay and the vesicle membrane has proteins known as v snare proteins right V for vesicle, so V snare proteins are present on the vesicle, and T snare, T is for terminal, so T snare proteins are uh, present on the nerve terminal. So there is fusion of this vesicle by means of V snare protein interacting with the T snare proteins on the presynaptic membrane, and with this fusion, there is release of acetylcholine in the synaptic space. So what is the fourth point? That is fusion of the vesicles. with the presynaptic membrane and what is the fifth point that is release of acetylcholine right so these are all presynaptic uh, events now coming to the postsynaptic events postsynaptic events involve when this acetylcholine diffuses through the synaptic space and reaches to the n acetylcholine receptors which are present on the motor end plate now this space it is very small actually it is in nanometers it is only 20 nanometers fine so diffusion occurs very fast and this acetylcholine binds to n acetylcholine receptor so what is the first event in postsynaptic events so first event is binding of acetylcholine to n acetylcholine receptor right then when this happen it will lead to opening of this uh, channels which are ligand gated sodium channels and there will be entry of sodium from outside to inside the muscle membrane so it will lead to entry or influx of sodium ions now this influx of sodium ions causes depolarization of the muscle membrane and this is known as generation of end plate potential okay end plate potential so entry of sodium from this n acetylcholine receptors leads to generation of end plate potential so this end plate potential is a graded change in potential it is not an action potential so more the acetylcholine release more is this graded change in potential okay so as it is increasing there will be a point that it reaches to the thresholds potential change will reach to the threshold and this will lead to the opening of these voltage gated sodium channels and will lead to more entry of sodium ions causing the generation of fourth point that is action potential potential generation so remember first there is generation of end plate potential and only when end plate potential reaches to the threshold there will be generation of action potential
But one thing is very important here that physiologically, in physiological conditions, always end plate potential reaches to the threshold and there is generation of action potential. It is important. Why? Because when the information is coming from the neuron to the muscle, then the transmission of impulse takes place and then muscle contracts. There is movement. We don't want a chance based, right? We don't want it that uh, message comes and the end plate potential has not reached to the threshold and action potential doesn't occur. It should not be like that. Every time we think of moving, the impulse should lead to generation of action potential in the muscle and hence contraction. So that is physiological. But in some pathological condition, it doesn't happen. That is in myasthenia gravis, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Fine. So that were the steps, presynaptic events and postsynaptic events in the steps of neuromuscular transmission. Moving on to what happens to acetylcholine once it is released. See, one action potential causes release of some acetylcholine in the synaptic space which binds with an acetylcholine receptor. Now it is important that this acetylcholine should also be removed from the space. If it is there like for a very long time then it will continuously stimulate that N-acetylcholine receptor and repeatedly we will have end plate potentials and action potentials that we don't want. One action potential should lead to one contraction. Fine, so what happens to acetylcholine? How is it removed from the space? I told you before that we have acetylcholinesterase enzyme in the synaptic space and uh, that acetylcholinesterase enzyme breaks down acetylcholine to choline and acetyl-CoA. Okay, so these are the molecules from which it was formed, acetyl-CoA plus choline. So it breaks it down and this choline is again taken up by the nerve terminal and again acetylcholine, more acetylcholine is synthesized. So that is one breakdown of the acetylcholine and taking up of the choline. Second, some of the acetylcholine just diffuses out of the neuromuscular space. And third one is that acetylcholine itself is taken up by the nerve terminal and it is reused. So these are the various fates of acetylcholine and it is very important that acetylcholine should remain there for a very brief amount of time. And we will see later in neuromuscular blockers that what happens that if an acetylcholine receptor is repeatedly stimulated. So we don't want that, fine. Right? Coming to some applied aspect that what are the poisons or the drugs which act on neuromuscular junction. So we have the drugs which act on the presynaptic membrane and we have the drugs which act on the postsynaptic membrane. So let us see them one by one. So first one is the drugs which block the voltage gated calcium channels. Okay, voltage gated calcium channel if it is blocked then there will be no neuromuscular transmission as we saw that how calcium is so much important for neuromuscular transmission right. So these are known as conotoxins. Before this some books have also given that if a voltage gated sodium channels are blocked then there will be no neuromuscular transmission. Yes it will not be there because the impulse generation itself will not be there. So when voltage gated sodium channels are blocked actually it leads to inhibition of generation of action potential itself right. So this is one thing. Second is there might be drugs or poisons which block the fusion of vesicles on to the membrane right and one of that toxin is botulin. So Clostridium botulinum produces this toxin and because of this it prevents the fusion of vesicle with the presynaptic membrane thus preventing neuromuscular transmission. Remember we discussed about those V snare and T snare proteins. It basically destroys those proteins and hence prevents the fusion of the vesicles. Third toxin is hemicholinium. Hemicholinium blocks the uptake of choline, thus decreasing the resynthesis of acetylcholine. So the amount of acetylcholine which is available that is going to decrease. Then we have uh, some drugs which inhibit the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. So these drug is neostigmine. Neostigmine. So what will happen if we use these drugs which inhibit enzyme acetylcholinesterase? More acetylcholine will accumulate. Okay, these drugs are used in a condition that is myasthenia gravis. Okay, myasthenia gravis. 
so they inhibit enzyme acetylcholinase trace causing accumulation of acetylcholine then we have neuromuscular blockers which are clinically used and these are competitive neuromuscular blockers competitive neuromuscular blockers what they do is they bind with the n acetylcholine receptors okay competitive neuromuscular blockers so that is why there competition between the drug and the acetylcholine example of this is tubocurarine tubocurarine or curare right these are clinically used drugs and then we have another drug which stimulates an acetylcholine receptors and these are known as non competitive non competitive or also known as depolarizing depolarizing neuromuscular blockers okay because you see when they bind with n acetylcholine receptors they will cause depolarization but you will wonder that how anything which is causing an acetylcholine receptor stimulation will block the neuromuscular transmission because these competitive and non competitive neuromuscular blockers as the name suggests they are used for blocking the transmission of the neuromuscular junction actually these non competitive blockers they cause persistent stimulation they just don't uh, detach from these acetylcholine receptors so they cause persistent stimulation and what happens this voltage gated sodium channels as i told you before they are present here so these become inactivated inactivated it is important that voltage gated sodium channel should open inactivate and again close there are three states of sodium channels but with persistent depolarization they don't come from inactivated to the closed state which will happen only when the membrane potential reduces that is come back to rmp so that is not happening in this case sodium channels are all inactivated so this doesn't lead to a new action potential in the muscle membrane right so persistent depolarization also blocks the neuromuscular transmission so these are the various drugs which block the neuromuscular transmission the poisons which act on the presynaptic membrane then we discuss about the drugs which act on the postsynaptic membrane in the drugs we have acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and we have neuromuscular blockers neuromuscular blockers again we have competitive and non competitive neuromuscular blockers coming to the diseases of neuromuscular transmission so three main diseases we will discuss one is myasthenia gravis in myasthenia gravis there is formation of auto antibodies against n acetylcholine receptor so this is a autoimmune disease okay in which our body itself produces antibodies against n acetylcholine receptors and some of these antibodies go and bind to it and finally they destroy these n acetylcholine receptors so the density of this n acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane reduces fine and we saw in the diagram that how it is thrown into folds and here there are n acetylcholine receptors actually what we see is flattening of these folds in this disease right so what will happen if this n acetylcholine receptors are destroyed the acetylcholine will not be sufficient to stimulate the n acetylcholine receptors we will need more and more acetylcholine to be present to stimulate these n acetylcholine receptors whatever are left right so this leads to decrease in the end plate potential and hence if end plate potential decreases there are chances that this end plate potential is not going to reach to the threshold and there will not be any action potential so that's why we get weakness of the muscle weakness of the muscle a detailed video on myasthenia gravis i have already made you please have a look on that i have given the link in the description section i am not going to detail fully this myasthenia gravis here but here just remember that the auto antibodies form against n acetylcholine receptors causes its destruction and hence there is weakness of the muscle then we have lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome this is also a autoimmune disorder autoimmune disorder in which antibodies form against voltage gated calcium channels so myasthenia gravis is a disease of the postsynaptic membrane lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome is a disease of the presynaptic membrane where antibodies form against the voltage gated calcium channels 
And again, because of this, there will be decrease in vesicle fusion, isn't it? Because calcium entry will be less, decrease in vesicle fusion to the presynaptic membrane, decrease release of the acetylcholine, hence decrease in end plate potential, again, which may not reach to the threshold, again causing weakness of the muscle. Then we have botulism. We have seen it before also that botulism destroys the synaptic proteins and prevents the fusion of the vesicles to the presynaptic membrane. So again, there is decrease in the release of acetylcholine, right? And this is an acute disease. And the features are similar to that of the myasthenia gravis, but they present very acutely because of the presence of the toxin. So that was all about uh, neuromuscular transmission. We saw the details of the functional anatomy of the neuromuscular junction. Then we saw the presynaptic and postsynaptic events in neuromuscular transmission. Then we saw the fate of acetylcholine. Then we also discussed about the drugs which act on neuromuscular junction. And then in brief, we also saw the diseases which act on neuromuscular junction. Thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, do press the like button and do share the video with your friends and do subscribe to the channel Physiology Open.